The Age of Uncertainty. That was a book uh, by John Kenneth Galbraith, and, and it looked at the upsides of the markets, but also some of the downsides of how capitalism operates, because there's always conflicting forces. So something that economists study, including our next guest, Stephen Polos. Not only is he an economist, but of course, he's the former governor of the Bank of Canada. So his most recent book is The Next Age of Uncertainty, where he wrestles some of the tectonic forces, as he calls them, that are leading to the economic volatility and the uncertainty and the risk that's out there. So we're really pleased to have you with us, Stephen. Welcome. And and just for the sake of the audience, I will say this book, which I've now read twice, mm-hmm. um, The Next Stage of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Risky or Future, is because I sit on a book jury and uh, and Mr. Polos won the uh, business book, the National Business Book Award of the Year, amongst many other things. So welcome. Now we can talk. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. <laughs> it's great. So you were governor of the bank. It gives you a view that very few, like a dozen people, um, actually have a perspective from inside. What troubles you most when you get up in the morning? My, what a stark <laughs> question that is. Well, I know, that's hard. I don't mean the kids. I don't mean coffee. I yes. mean the fate of the nation, the fate Very of the good. world. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, I, to, to, you know, I really think like many people, I think it, politics or I, maybe I should say geopolitics yeah. because it seems it transcends borders so much, uh, seems to be my major preoccupation these days. And I worry about all the things that could go wrong. Uh, many, many of the things I worry about are well-intentioned politics, and yet uh, either poorly informed or perhaps just trying to reconcile too many competing views in order to come to a solution and maybe causing problems rather than than fixing them. But anyway, that's I've tr- I've kind of gone from the grand to the granular in that answer because you yeah. can go right down to your neighborhood and ask, are you do you see silly things happening in your in the city you live in, and for sure you can. But of course, what I really mean is at the global level, we are at a place where people are are unhappy and growing more unhappy, yeah. and every vein of unhappiness gets amplified through social media and becomes kind of a movement. And I think makes politics, I don't have to tell you this, politics already has always been the hardest job anywhere, but it's it's just almost becoming impossible. And as a result, uh, you get some uh, sort of crazy outcomes. And I think that's how I would explain what Putin is up to in Ukraine, uh, other populist type of, uh, you know, uh, reactions to the underlying discontent which I think comes from, as an economist, I look at income inequality as the most important driver. The share of income going to people is as low as it's been in human history. Okay, so that's interesting. You're thinking this, uh, or you seem to be suggesting this is kind of coming from the bottom up, like Hmm. people are hurting and the world as they knew it or imagined it or hoped it to be is not that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then that is driving the politics. I was just listening to a discussion last night about Putin and and the assessment was kind of at the top end, which is Joe Biden appeared weak and didn't do anything when Putin made aggressive moves. And so Putin said, "Okay, this is my chance. I want to stay in power forever. I'm just going to walk into Ukraine and and take it back. Mm -hmm. And that he doesn't give a damn what his population Think. So we kind of have things going on at both at, in both levels. Yes, I agree. Uh, so the way I, I think of it, and just how, how you posed it there, is, is in effect the discontent in the major economies, and let's just focus on the U.S. for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, income inequality is quite severe and getting worse uh, in the United States. 
And there's a whole cohort, which is getting bigger and bigger, that's been left behind, or certainly they feel that they have been. And I think that leads to that preoccupation with domestic concerns in the U.S. Uh, political zone, so that they're, you know, they kind of get distracted or think international issues aren't their issues. We're much more concerned about our issues. And so under Trump in particular, it really became clear that this meant a form of creeping isolationism and less leadership uh, at, at the global level. I'm not saying zero leadership, of yeah. course, uh, but it's a bit like, you know, Ian Bremmer uses this term G0, you know, which is, you know, it's kind of a leaderless thing where that international consensus of collaboration and getting things done as a team has drawn back from the table. And that leaves a vacuum for for people like Putin or Xi or or anybody other uh, type that you want to name. There are others, you know, that just think I can get away with almost anything. So yeah. so I will. Well, and the leadership issues, you say, just kind of has broken down. I, I want to come back to 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 uh, economics directly in a moment. But when you see, you know, where our, our own prime minister does it, the U.S. president does it, whether it's the Middle East or Ukraine, we have your back. We're going to be there for you. You know, this will never stand. And then we can't find the equipment to send or we've run out of money or there's no consensus in the U.S. and Biden tells them just to make some concessions and get on with it. It doesn't look like we have leadership. So the Putins and the Xi's of the world are maybe right. Yeah. So and even if we have leadership, it takes a long time Yeah. Uh, to, to achieve through that consensus building process, however it may look. And it varies from place to place, but and throughout uh, the kind of um, the head, the fence sitting that goes on along the yeah. way, uh, basically establishes an air of confusion or uncertainty, especially for companies, but obviously for ord for ordinary uh, uh, yeah. employees too. But for companies, and what would you do if you were a company? You're responsible to the shareholders for hundreds of millions or whatever it is dollars. Uh, when you're that uncertain, you just stop. You, you know, you you don't make bold plans or take risks or get things done. You stop too. And I think this uncertainty, which grows underneath, is one of the reasons why we just can't seem to get things done. And businesses kind of holding back. We don't get investment. We don't get productivity. We just don't progress like what we could if we could be a little more decisive clearer uh and we had um you know the more let's say well-established international framework right now it's being chipped away at, around the edges and eroding and uh it's not good for that business outlook fundamentally i'm i just was of course doing lots of reading um last night just to take a you know the survey so David Dodge, one of your predecessors, says the big issue with budgets, the way government operates, isn't debt, although that's stunning. The numbers are absolutely stunning in terms yeah. of our debt, but lack of growth. Um, we've done studies at the banking report about intellectual property, that we give it away, that we fund companies to do sort of front-end development, and then they get to a certain stage, and then they go, well, we might as well sell it to the big guys. So we're not, we're not keeping any of that. Mm -hmm. We've got the banks saying to the government, your reckless spending is what causes higher interest rates and the, and the economic crisis we've got. Like, it doesn't appear that anything is much working domestically either. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> well, you you put your finger on a number of important things, and uh, and uh, you know we can't be blaming politics uh, for yeah. all of this or policymakers uh, either. But we are an environment in which uh, things are going to be, I think, from a starting point, more difficult uh, for people to make the kinds of decisions that underlie better performance. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, you know, what, what's the what's the outlook for government spending in Canada? Well, we have uh, we have uh, twice a year we get the budget, and in the fall we get the fall economic statement. 
Well, what has happened over the last uh, five years or so, well, yeah, about five years, is that the share of the economy being taken up by the federal government has risen steadily. It's it's not just uh, bumps and wiggles. We're talking about almost two percentage points bigger share of, of the economy is being taken up by the federal government. That has to come from somewhere. Uh, yeah. And even if you say, well, I'm just going to run deficits in order, that doesn't change the fact that it will crowd out the activity. You know, there's only so much capacity in the economy, so it will crowd out what the private sector does. And one of the outlets for that has been companies in Canada increasingly investing in the United States as a hedge against, you know, uh, interruptions or problems with trade agreements or other trade to trade uh, policies, uh, which, you know, really had a genesis under Trump, but has not gone away. That uncertainty and risk means that companies want to hedge against those things. And that drags down our investment here. Uh, in the energy sector, we offer, you know, opacity, no, no clarity really about the future. So investment has fallen off there. And that's one of been our most b biggest right. sources of productivity over the years. So, and then, as you say, the you know the IP, the new the new folks, you know, the productivity in a dynamic economy, most of it comes from brand new things that go from zero to something in a short space of time. The hockey stick that you see for these yeah. dynamic companies, and uh, and I think we've been doing a pretty good job at the starting point. As you say, it doesn't follow through as much as we'd like to see. And that can have to do with the financing environment, your ability to finance a growing uh, company as opposed to a new. We have a focus on small. We have tax systems that favor small companies instead of young companies. Yeah. Huge difference between those two. Yeah. We actually yeah. have an incentive to keep your small company small instead yeah. of growing it, right? The tax system kind of biases you that way. So we've got a few things that we could be doing on the policy front just to make it easier for the private sector to do its thing. And I can think of that as low-hanging fruit, and yet it requires political will or cohesion or something to get it done. And there are just so many pots on the stove, you can't really get the attention on one or two or half a dozen of these things. But philosophically, you have to want to do that. And and my sense is, and you reinforced it in that one way, that the role of government is getting bigger and they're putting their hands in way more many pies. <laughs> and, and they're trying to kind of guide things. This is what we want to have happen on the climate. So we're going to punish you and reward mm -hmm. you, um, which, which takes the natural market forces out of play or at least constrains them so that you don't have kind of a normal reaction to what's going on. True. Right? So, uh, and and let's not forget that some of those intentions are the best of intentions. Yeah, and sure. Don't disagree with them at all. Uh, but take climate as an example where in the, in the beginning you thought, well, the main approach, and most economists would agree that if you're going to control emissions, you put a price on emissions or, uh, you know, a, a, a tax, what have you, uh, on carbon emissions. And that tax grows through time. That will cause people to adjust their behavior and produce less emissions. Uh, if you have to do it, do even more to have the effect you're looking for, well, you do even more. But you use that one tool and uh, the economy will react. Uh, well, you know, okay, started out that way, but then it became... Well, we also need to have a rule that says we have to all have an electric car by a certain right. Right. Well, Well, wait a minute. I thought you're trying to control emissions. Why wouldn't you let the market and people decide how they're going to? So if people have to drive, you know, in the north a lot or they can. In Saskatchewan, hello. You know, well, exactly. <laughs> so let the market control the yeah. emissions in however way you think is best, but then let the market figure out. And oh, no, we've got to make it uh, illegal to have a plastic straw. Yeah. Well, OK, I understand the thinking, but these are like almost arbitrary things uh, yeah. rather than letting the economy do its thing. Right. And so I think, uh, and, and that just adds to that sense of confusion, because you know that, you know, around the corner could be some other change that you weren't expecting as a business. And uh, you may not get consulted, or you might get consulted, it doesn't matter. In the end, it, it happens. Yeah. 
Now you have to adapt to it instead of going about your business uh, with a known set of parameters. Um, so I, I do think that underlying uh, sort of interventionist thing is something that is holding us back. And, uh, and also, of course, the inability to necessarily agree between federal and provincial. I mean, almost all these things we're right. mentioning have those dimensions. And then, of course, cities in some cases. So you really have a lack of a collaboration uh, that gets in the way of many decisions. And therefore, uh, businesses and people are left in the fog. Well, and you're also, we're sitting next door to uh, to the U.S., our largest trading partner. Um, we expect them to be a market economy. And then Joe Biden does something like the IRA, which yeah. is just sucking the investment dollars, as you say, south of the border, because he's just saying, we'll give you money if you come here and do it here. So this is a, a form of let, let's not have a, a price on carbon. Let's yeah. instead provide incentives to right. to achieve. And so, and I, you know, as I said, I, I don't mind which way <laughs> one goes as long as just you pick, pick <laughs> one and instead of making it a jumble, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, and so, you have to admit that the IRA is creating a significant boom in investment. So, uh, people talk about the deficit in the federal uh, government deficit in the United States. Like it's it's off the charts, and so on. But what that what deficit represents is a decline in in tax revenues because of the incentives for companies to invest. <clears throat> well, if that, that's what's happening, that means that that deficit is actually creating new capacity in the economy, and it's in a green band. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, in contrast, your deficit reflects uh, providing support to individuals or to companies in behind to buffer their, make them more resilient to shocks, well, that's not productive investment. Yeah. Okay, so there's a completely different orientation between those two, two things, and so and we're uh, doing the latter. Yes, mostly, uh, mostly, and where we're doing something different, it's a little bit ad hoc. You know, well, let's have a yeah. let's go go really hard on a battery plant. I think it's great that we could attract battery plants. That's all part of an ecosystem, and if we if we do keep at it and create an ecosystem. Uh, in those electric vehicles, that's going to be good. We'll be a player. I see all that. And yet it's not part of a comprehensive approach. And so again, business will, will sit back. So I'm not going to decide anything until I hear whether or not I'm going to get a subsidy or if I'm going to get you yeah. know, something, uh, some icing on my cake or whatever. That just means that business gets slowed down because you haven't given them clarity from the start. And then you have to, if you're making those kinds of huge corporate long-term decisions, then you have to wait for all the court cases. We're just looking at a series yeah. of these on Bill 69, <clears throat> on plastic bags. I mean, less so on the on the truckers and whether that was a violation. But it all speaks to the uncertainty in the economy about whether the laws and the bills that are put forward by government are actually going to even stand. Yeah. So, so more time. Uh, yeah. My, my favorite example, uh, not, not that it illustrates everything we're saying, but if you take the TMX pipeline, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's been about 12 years since inception. Um, and so every year in those 12 years has been, it's been a black hole for money, whether it was, the upfront studying and then all that, the consultation processes and on and on. And then, of course, construction. And we still haven't turned it on. But when we do turn it on, we'll get literally productivity. That the productivity numbers for the Canadian economy might go up by 0 0.3, 0 0.4, even 0.5 percentage points every year from now on. Well, that's real money. But they can't change the fact that measured productivity has been negative from that. Right for all those years. So it detracts from our measures of economic performance throughout that period. And so I, I think making things things that take really long, if, 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 if we took the other way, if it took four years to do that in the United States, that's why they can be really ahead of us, even though they have many of the same checks and balances. 
So somehow, you know, we need to find a, a better way. So if indigenous consultation uh, can be facilitated by creating a full backstop uh, financial entity that allows First Nations to tap in, and therefore the, the major roadblock goes away to those kinds yeah. of reconciliation conversations. Well, then, then maybe we can speed things up by several years, and and also off give the energy sector the clarity. Like as long as you're controlling emissions, getting them down to net zero, you're doing your job, you're doing your bit, and you're going to be the best provider of conventional energy in the world. Then but, that's but, that's but a worthy that's goal. Issue. Like, what yeah. are we going to eventually allow to flow through that pipeline? Well, so <laughs> when we we're having that. <laughs> Well, we don't know. Is it a 50-year asset or is it only a 20-year asset? That really makes a huge difference to the whole question, doesn't it? And so the clarity is what's lacking. Uh, Like that's what you can read experts uh, everywhere who say, look, we're not going to get off oil and gas for 25, 30 years. We just can't. A, we don't have the replacements in place. B, people are moving really quickly to do that. But all you have to do is look at Alberta recently to say we're living pretty close to the edge given the kind of climate that we have. But but a government that says this must happen by 2025 and this must happen by 2030, et cetera, doesn't allow... Um, for any discussion around that and and saying, can we please just acknowledge that we're going to need it for a while? And then worse yet, separate issue, doesn't let us respond to our allies like Germany and other parts of, of Europe when the Russian energy supply gets cut off because they're uh, they're in Ukraine and we're mad and they're busy. Uh, right. You know, <laughs> we've really set ourselves up in a in a really complicated situation for not only businesses who have no clarity, but for consumers, for what do you tell your kids to be when they grow up, when we don't know what it's going to look like? Yes, indeed. Um, I I often find that uh, people have not bothered to do the arithmetic behind these things. And And it gets back to the earlier point you made, that there's a sense of overlaying arbitrary things on top of what is actually a very good positive aspiration. So if we focus on carbon emissions, what can we do to do our part for the world to reduce carbon emissions and make a better future for our kids and grandchildren? And uh, the answer is pretty clear, but it does not have to include the elimination of conventional energy. Uh, I think uh, Canada could be a a global leader in carbon capture uh, technology. We could invest a great deal on that. We have a huge incentive to do so because we are a global leader in conventional energy wealth. And so if we can solve society's problem, which which technologically is not hard, is scaling, that's going to be the next step. That's going to just take investment. It's going to take money. And, uh, you know, you may be able to use conventional energy literally forever. You know, yeah. on, on Star Trek, they use conventional yeah. energy. I so, mean, if it's clean, why not? Uh, yeah, right. exactly. So, so um, you know, I, I've asked people if they remember. I'm I'm old enough to remember, but you you would you would remember when, like magic, the government said we need to clean up the pollution coming out of automobiles. Right. <clears throat> so somebody smart invented the catalytic converter, and that was like 50 years ago. Exactly. I can you imagine what our air would be like today if we had not invented the catalytic converter? Yeah. It would be like that when you go to Mumbai or something, right? It'd yeah. be that yeah. quality, and you'd be like, "Wow, ever ever good that we have that catalytic converter." Well, we're you know, it's it's that kind of thing—a fifty-year-old technology. The difference that it has made. Well, there's some other technology that we need to be investing heavily in right now to tackle emissions directly. Instead of assuming, therefore, we have to force people to make 40 other arbitrary decisions along the way that may or may not be consistent with an endpoint. Well, well, as you say, like carbon capture is, is the modern day version of that. It's there. And there just seems to be not an incentive to um, adapt and, and make those kinds of creative choices as opposed to just banning it all you know well, you whether- see, that, that's what the ira does 
Exactly. So, you know, the IRA kind of says, look, this, this is a way to tackle the problem. So show us the money here. Yeah. Do it. And we'll give you the tax tax break to prove that we care about it. Right. And yeah. so I think, uh, you know, in the end, um, I'm hopeful that we'll see great things emerging from <laughs> that and that we'll be we'll find ways to collaborate and be part of it here in Canada. Are you really an optimist, given everything that you know? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I suppose I, 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 it's hard for me to be be an optimist, but I wake up every morning pretty optimistic. And I think it's mainly technology that does that for me. When I think about what has happened uh, in you know in the last 30 years, and I think, wow, if, if only half of that happens over the next 30 years, that's a pretty big difference. Yeah. And, and so uh, I'm... I, I mean, you know, you see how AI has kind of leaped, uh, leapt onto the stage in yeah. the last year or so. And yet really all that is, is progression along the digitization theme, which is what we call the fourth industrial revolution. AI is just sort of part of that. Uh, and along with the biotech that gave us, uh, you know, vaccines in just yeah. a couple of months instead of five years. I mean, these are tremendous leaps in technology that are in underneath our economy and uh you know back in uh, the early 80s when the pc first showed up and you thought, well what am i yeah. going to use that for you know i <laughs> i'm not going to use that thing well my goodness could you get through your day now without yeah. you know and so your cell phone was this big right? well yes well i don't think there were cell. well anything i guess there were yeah, yeah. anyway uh all i'm saying is that uh, we always underestimate the power of tech and we're we've 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 kind of the the computer chip revolution kind of has run out of gas we have chips in everything we saw you know during the pandemic how important that was because there's a chip in your exercise bike and a thermostat on the wall of your house and there's a chip in every window of your car and you know there's chips well okay there they've made a huge difference uh, and now we can find our luggage when it gets lost isn't that interesting <laughs> and so uh, exactly and so all those things is spread everywhere and that's what we mean by yeah. general purpose technology digitization is similar but invisible to people yeah. Uh, when a company digitizes its operations, that means it creates a, a model of itself and then is able to tweak it with real time data through different ways. And, you know, a company like consultant will give, save you 10 to 15 percent off of costs in, uh, in any ordinary company through digitizing there. Yeah. That's an amazing leap in productivity that's just getting going. And AI is a facilitator of this. It's not yeah. just us asking AI questions. So yeah. I'm, I think this is going to be the next big thing. Uh, it's already started. You can see evidence, and it's going to take maybe 10 years. Uh, but that's my biggest optim optimism source, if you like. Yeah. Uh, it, it really will make a big difference to all of us. And, of course, it will just be disrupt us, just like every other industrial revolution. Yes. So yes, we, have to, we have to be resilient to it. Yes, the horse and buggy will go away, and whatever our horse and buggies are today. Correct. Okay, other skill testing question, because you're talking about, uh, well, several of them, about digitization. So um, just around Christmas time, the Bank of Canada started to take some quiet steps to um, have ownership or control over a digital currency. Now, from the time you were there and subsequent uh Governors of the Bank of Canada have all said, "No, this is this is not on. This is not something uh, that we're going to do." And and Bitcoin and all this stuff is just crazy. Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing yes, here. Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> but but Bitcoin is back, and mm. we see the Bank of Canada saying this somehow seems inevitable, and we better get our hands on that before somebody else. Uh, owns it and some outsiders. I know lots of people in this field who have uh, taken their businesses and based them somewhere else because they know digital currency is inevitable uh, and they've tried to help governments think it through, but people don't want their help. What what What's your take on this? <clears throat> well, I certainly agree that that uh, digital payments. I'm gonna I'm gonna change yeah, okay. the terminology on you. That yeah, yeah. The digital payments uh, are inevitable. In fact, mostly that's what we already use. 
Um, and so, and, and, and no one, none of us would say, you know, worry that if I use my debit card just to tap on something or, you know, what have you, um, that the fact that my bank is paying that person like instantly and uh, there's a record created every time I do that. Okay. I do. I go to bed wondering if if they're going to give those inform that information to somebody. No, would I switch to? Uh, you know use they are. <laughs> I know, but 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 if I do, I am I going to switch to using money out of my pocket because yeah. I'm worried that my bank is going to reveal that I paid someone for my haircut later today. Yeah. I mean that's just ridiculous to me. And so where I where I where I get annoyed is when I hear that. If it's a central bank that's going to provide that service or make it available, it's not the same as being the only, it's just something that's available to you, that somehow that's intrusive and taking away your privacy and it's, you know, big brother watching your every move is, is ridiculous. Uh, if that's if that's your concern, then go use Bitcoin. Yeah. Be my guest. And that's where the that's where the global criminals are operating anyway. So off you go. Uh, so the the central bank's job is to offer up the means of payment that people want to use. And today, people still want to use a fair bit of cash in their pocket. And there are uh, lots of reasons for that. I won't go into them. It just it just makes perfect sense that it be available for people. Uh, but increasingly, there's a trend towards digital payments for things. You know, if if that's that's fine, and if we end up using a Canadian bank utility of some kind, then it's all part of the system, and it's a Canadian dollar that's uh, that's doing it. No problems with that at all. Mm -hmm. But let's suppose instead that Facebook creates a new money altogether called the Libra, or you know, what I forgot DM that it was called yeah. at one point. Um, and that everybody who's on Facebook says, hey, I'm going to use that. That's that's interesting. I'll use that. That's safe, I guess. It's private. Anyway, so people glom onto it. And you and all your friends that are on Facebook are, you know, oh, I, I, it's my turn to pay for dinner. It's all done through, uh, through Facebook. And you do international payments even because there's people on Facebook everywhere. That sounds like a great thing. It solves problems, right? Uh, so if people glom onto that, suddenly a higher percentage of Canadians are using something called a DM to do their transactions. Right. And there, in, in that instant, what has happened is the central bank is losing its ability to moderate, not to control, but to moderate and influence how things go in the economy to our benefit. Okay, so well, or even know what the level of economic activity is. Well, you know, where the, the next step would be, you'd be you'd be making a mortgage in yeah. that new currency and paying an interest rate to through Facebook to somebody who's lending, and so there would be a completely parallel kind of financial system over which Canada, the, the Bank of Canada, would have no influence. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, no central bank can do that because that would mean they've fallen down on their responsibility to provide what it is people want in order to do their transactions. And therefore, I think all central banks need to be ready to provide a central bank digital currency, uh, which will be ultra safe. It will be, you know, no one's going to be forced to use it. You know, no one's going to be forced to have their information tracked with that thing. But they'll have the ability to use it, and it'll be exactly the same as the cash in your pocket in, a, in its function, in its properties, and, you know, ultimately its anonymity. So yeah. uh, I don't see what the issue is. I think the no, my it, it question, is inevitable. It is inevitable. My question was risk. more, why do we have to be quiet about this? I mean, yeah. anybody so I, under yeah. 20 or 30 lives this way. So it comes back to one of our earlier exchanges, which is that... Uh, you know, if you have a certain segment of, of society that says, I'm suspicious of this thing, um, and, and, and here's why, I heard that they'll just be able to track my every move. I'm like, okay, so do you, do you use a bank debit card now? Yeah. Well, the answer is no. If you're strictly a cash person, then you could, you, this, the central bank would not take away your ability to use cash and you could continue right. like before. And so they're not trying to take anything away from you, but add an option uh, for people. And it's an option which would compete with 
these other things that could come along, which would be less secure or less, uh, you have less confidence in them than you do in your central bank. So a central bank digital currency would have that extra layer of security, just what cash does in your pocket. Now, the cash in your pocket could have a counterfeit 20 in there, right? Yeah. It, it can happen. Yeah. And so and by that same token, this is literally safer. Yeah. Right? No, no, it wouldn't no. be possible to counterfeit it. And so there's there's even a, an argument for this. So I think as long as people get used to the idea that it may exist, you don't have to use it. It's up to you. That's the central bank's job. And people would see an advantage to that over using something. Let, let's say I keep picking on Facebook because it's a real example, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I shouldn't. Just anybody who offers up something, an alternative. Because that allows then the central bank to continue to monitor and understand the financial system and make sure there's no uh, major events that are going to take us all down or th that kind of thing right. uh, for financial stability reasons. And, of course, administer interest rates and keep the economy on an even keel as life goes on. Those are important functions, and we can't allow them to go away just because of innovation in payments. Right. So the other big job of the central bank, as we always talk about fiscal policy over in the government department and monetary policy over at the bank and, and you know, keeping, as you say, interest rates within a range so that we've got predictability. But along came this theory called modern monetary theory, mm -hmm. which as far as I can tell is just keep spending and ringing up the debt and it'll be somebody else's problem or it'll all get worked out in the wash. And, and there's now books being written about why government should just deficit spend um, until they're thrown out of office and the next guy should do it. Even the bank, you get a sense, and we've seen the the other level of banks, the, the big six sort of saying, we've got to curb the spending. Mm -hmm. It's distorting everything. Yeah. So now that you're not sitting at the Bank of Canada, what's your view? I mean, there was the pandemic, and of course, we understood government spent then. But even now, we're looking back and saying way too much, unnecessary in yeah. that way. Um, what, what, so what are your thoughts on modern monetary theory? <laughs> Well, I, I took a I took a swipe at MMT modern monetary <laughs> theory in the book, yeah, uh, because it was it was actually a pretty hot uh, topic uh, during the time when I was writing, and yeah. uh, I mean it, it's it's like many uh, uh, branches of economics. There is just enough truth in it to make it seem completely plausible on the surface. <laughs> Um, but if you read one of the books, the best book probably to read is Stephanie Kelton's yes. book. Yes. And uh, I've interviewed with, her. So okay. I, well, yeah. great. So, yeah. so, so, you know, she gets right into it and, and, yeah. and, and I've had conversations with her and, uh, and so I'll say uh, something like, uh, well, hang on. Wh how, how, what about this? I mean, look, if, 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 if you're right, uh, then, then everything we've done over the past thirty years has been right, but just by accident, right? <laughs> and 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 it says no, you're you're looking at it backwards. I'm like, well, okay, everything. There's a head and a tail on every coin. Yeah, it's yeah. still the same coin. Mm -hmm. And so the accounting that modern monetary theory puts out is perfectly legitimate. It's the public balance sheet and where the central bank fits into the government. And that's exactly right. It's when when I went to school, we called it uh, unpleasant monetarist arithmetic, which is to <laughs> say there is a connection between the government balance sheet and the yep. central bank balance sheet. And when it all gets done, the books have to settle, and the central bank fills the gap. If that's what's going to happen, that's that's. And so uh, Stephanie would call that well, that's modern monetary theory in action. I say, well, no, actually, it's the central bank doing what it does in order to keep the interest rate where it thinks it should be to deliver 2% inflation. Yeah. But she says, no, we're looking at it backwards. And and uh, and so, but when you press them on this, they'll say, well, of course, you can't continue to spend as you described in your intro. You can't spend, 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 spend without limit because the economy has limits. Right. The economy has only so much it can deliver, and if you go beyond that, 
it will be inflationary. Oh. Oh, yeah. So you need to stop. Well, where do you stop? Well, when inflation st starts to take off, you stop. And, uh, and that is in the fine print in Stephanie's book. Right? <laughs> and so this is hardly ever getting any attention, though, from the, you know, the, the quick conversations around modern monetary theory. And so I say to her then, OK, then that means then we've just happened to have done it just the right amount of modern monetary theory for the last 30 years to give us 2% inflation. <laughs> and, you know, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> okay. So it is two different paradigms or in interpretations of the world exactly. that are actually head and tail to each other. They're, they're two sides of a coin, and the limitless thing is not true. Okay. But and so the when you get to well, are well, using that. There government. you are. Well, well this yeah. is where the, the confusion, you know, our politicians, I don't like to slag them, but I mean, they're busy. So they're, for them, somebody says, yeah, you can use modern monetary theory and off you go. Well, that sounds pretty attractive if you if you haven't dug in just as you and I just did. Yeah. And so and so you have to be able to say, OK, like during the pandemic, uh, government's going to spend, you know, almost without limit. Yeah. But there was a limit. The limit was what can the economy actually produce? And after the economy came back on track and everybody else was spending again, we know it was a bit too much. And the government was causing, adding to the inflation problem as we came out. So that's, of course, turning an aircraft carrier. They, and they, <laughs> if they turned a little faster, maybe it would have been lower interest rates, not as much inflation. I think that's that's absolutely the case. Uh, but it's easy to say that now. Yeah. At the time, we're, it's hard, much harder. Where do you think we're at right now? I mean, the, the American economy, of course, it's election year, so they're all running around saying the U.S. economy is just great. Uh, but that's basically because the government is spending crazily, so there's a lot of activity, or at least spending a lot. Um, and and here, it's a slightly different thing. We, we didn't have you know, the the recession in that way, although technically it's there. But it it certainly doesn't feel good for a whole lot of people. I mean, I literally had these conversations with neighbors over Christmas. They were they were having a small ham, not a big turkey. Like it was that real. Right. So um I th I think uh, maybe an apt characterization is both economies uh, have their head in the oven and the feet in the freezer. Uh, <laughs> so there's somebody on both ends of this. Um, and, and, and when you add it all up, as macroeconomists do, it adds up to roughly nothing. Like, in other words, the economies are stagnating, not, not really growing, possibly in recession, possibly not. doesn't really matter, not progressing. Yeah. And, but some things are pretty hot and other parts are really cold. And um, and that's because of the mechanism of inflation control. The mechanism of inflation control is you raise interest rates and that affects ordinary people, like the people you talk to uh, over Christmas, uh, first of all. Okay, that's that's where they if they had to renew their mortgage already, they've already had a 30 or 40 percent or sometimes even larger increase yep. in their mortgage payments. If they were on a floating, then it happened immediately. Those are on a more uh, less frequent renewal. They're they're waiting for it. So Canadians are slowing down for that reason. In the United States, other the effect is they have blocked in with 30 year mortgages and they don't have to face that renewal cycle. What what it affects there is the decision to be your first to buy your first home. Okay, interest rates are much higher than they were, and so people say, "No, I'm not going to do that." So it slows down that sector. Consumers are still relatively okay in the United States, different from Canada because of that mortgage cycle. Um, investment is stronger in the U.S. and weaker in Canada for the reasons you and I have talked about. And so you have these big big differences in the economy mm -hmm. right now. And roughly they add up to a weak economy and people think sufficiently weak that inflation should be continuing to decelerate. That's the key. And so it just means kind of hovering in this place long enough for supply to catch up with demand, which it already has. Now we have excess supply. 
And so that excess supply should gradually put pressure down on inflation. But the weird thing is that you can still have, you know, really low or even negative inflation in some parts of the economy, like in the goods sector. I think we're going to see deflation in cars um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, the interest rates on leases or going for a car are very high. And we're just seeing the leading edge of that with the uh, the electric car makers cutting their prices. I'll, I think we'll see lower pricing across the board for cars. So we're going to see negative inflation in some categories while we still have positive inflation, especially in shelter, because of the population boom that has boosted rents and as well, of course, you know, the housing. Market, houses, yeah. Yeah. And of course, the interest costs, you know, are an important yep. part yep. Of, of the shelter in the in the CPI. So for all those reasons, we have this big gap between certain parts of inflation and certain parts of really low or disinflation, deflation, averaging out to around 3%. And hopefully the average keeps creeping down. And I expect it will. So all, all to say is a very complex thing. And that's why you can bump into one person that thinks it's dreadful out there. Um, you know, the old the old saying was, if if your neighbor loses their job, that could be that could be a slowdown. If you lose your job, that's a recession for sure. You know, you <laughs> oh, you know, exactly. so, but but what happens is when your neighbor loses their job, you start to worry about it. Yeah, and people start to pull back and prepare for the mortgage renewal and all that. So everything slows down. And I think the economy is far more sensitive to interest rates today, given the level of debt we're carrying, than it was ever in the past. And we have a lot of that adjustment still to come over the next year or two. So that's an interesting, um, like this is now a permanent sort of situation is is we're into the era of higher interest rates. We, I mean, when I got my first mortgage, it was in the 20s, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then we had this um, extended period of very low, sometimes essentially zero interest rates. Now they're going back up and people are, as you say, saying there's a crisis. Are we just readjusting so that five becomes normal instead of one? In part. Uh, so it, there, there's two parts of this. And that's, uh, so we, 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 we said repeatedly in the last 10 years, you should not get used to zero interest rates. Yeah. This yeah. is this is an emergency or you know what have you. Uh, so don't this is not normal. Someday things will normalize. So don't plan. And that's why you had a two percentage point uh, barrier to getting a mortgage. You had to prove yeah. you could manage it, um, and it's still it's still in place. So <clears throat> when uh, let's say interest rates were roughly normal, interest rates are roughly we think around three ish. I'll say ish because between us. Nobody yep. really knows where that is exactly, but at around three, we went to zero during an emergency. Then we quickly normalized to three. That would have been normal, but because we had inflation, rates have gone above that yep. so to five. So I think, myself, roughly speaking, we should end up more like at three, but that will take, I don't know, an un- undetermined amount of time for us to drift back down uh, to around three. Now, some would argue maybe we are in a new era where the the long term rate ends up being more like four. I don't know yeah. that, and I don't think anybody does. Yeah. So, so from what I know, it's still three. So we go down below, then we go up above, get things under control, and then get ourselves back down to normal. So we do have some good news from the, on that front, I think, to come over the next year or two. Um, and the f- sooner it happens, the fewer people will have to renew at these yep. rates. Yeah. And that'll be great. Uh, but um, it's a very risky call for anybody to be definitive about because this is driven by such diver- uh, such a wide diversity of forces. And as I discussed in the book, the, the, the population growth in yep. the world determines that steady state growth in the world. And – and that's your most important ingredient. If that's going to be lower forever, it's very unlikely that interest rates will be permanently in a higher era like you and I grew up with. Mm-hmm. But but it's more likely is that sort of three-ish zone is where we'll end up, which means after you take off inflation, the interest rate is about 1% after accounting for inflation. 
um, until somebody convinces me otherwise, I think that's where we'll head over the next. Okay, okay. this well, is a, an almost optimistic note here. <laughs> uh, well, technology will facilitate it <laughs> because technology is is a disinflationary force. Yeah, it makes everything cheaper for us, and so uh, that's how the benefits benefits of technology go from the inventor, right, yeah. and then the the companies that deploy the tech. And it ends up being in the pockets of individuals because it allows companies to compete with each other for lower prices yeah. across the board. And so in the end, we will all benefit in that way. And that's another reason why I don't think interest rates would stay at the levels we're at today. So there is there is good news on both of those fronts, provided you can train up and transition into a job. If you're in a job that's vulnerable to that technology, that's a yeah. big risk for you. And that's a different... And I think I think companies are going to really try to keep those people because they're going to face a shortage of workers from now to kingdom come. Yeah, for, that's exactly right. This book, and as I said, I did literally read it twice because first when it came out and then again in, in the context of winning awards, the next age mm -hmm. of uncertainty, how the world can adapt to a riskier future. And I think that's what you've been hearing from the former governor throughout this last hour. I really appreciate this conversation. I think it's helpful when people kind of can put things in a little bit of perspective instead of reacting to the crisis of the moment or the day or the latest action by a prime minister to or a president, right? We're, so thank you. You're you're now engaged in the education process. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, and 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 so are you. So thank you for your yeah, service. Yeah, that's and, what, uh, this is what we're trying to do. What you do, yeah. So the next stage of uncertainty: adapting to a riskier future. Stephen Polos, former governor of the Bank of Canada and economist, and now you're advising people in law firms and sitting on boards of companies and trying to make them smarter too. Well, I'm having fun. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Great to talk with you. Thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you again. Bye-bye. And that is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>